Super. So, so, so we're very happy um, to have uh, Professor Dennis Banduran uh, join us from um, from MSE uh, in NUS. You know, um, so Dennis is is you know a fantastic um, physicist. Um, you know, and and he he um he basically uh, you know uh, got his his PhD in the UK. Um, uh, I, you worked with Andre, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With with Andre, and then after that, you know, he became you know very you know. Um, uh, he became Papalado Fellow in, in in MIT. Worked on a variety of different things. Um, I guess in in um in 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 Manchester, you worked on hydrodynamics. That's correct. Yeah. And so he he basically showed a lot of these very interesting kind of vertical kind of you know uh, things that happen when you have strong interactions in graphene, um, and you get get you you turn the electron liquid into a hydrodynamical flows of of things. And he went to MIT, he worked on a lot of different things, but perhaps one of the more famous things that he worked on was this um, physio drag stuff with uh, 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 Dmitry Basov, um, which basically um, showed um, this very interesting effect in water um, uh, in, uh, that, that, that we, we basically know from a from, from, uh, from long time ago from, um, from, um, from water. So if you kind of run, um, uh, uh, um, if you run a kind of current flow of water, you know, the, the, um, the speed of light basically um, propagating through the water actually changes a little bit um, if, if it goes, you know, one way or the other way. Um, uh, um, so Dennis basically showed that this, this effect actually um, happens in, in graphene for graphene plasmons. Then by doing this, you can actually control the reciprocal and non-reciprocal flows of, of plasmons in, in, um, in, in graphene. And now he's he's basically started um, in, um, in in Singapore um, at NUS in the Department of Material Science and Engineering, and um, he uh, he's going to do very fantastic work in in these two D materials and other quantum materials, I, I suspect. And I, I think he's going to tell us um, some very interesting things about what he's been thinking about recently. So 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 please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Justin. Yeah, thanks a lot for introduction and for the invitation. You know, it's my very first talk in Singapore. I arrived four months ago, uh, and it's a particular pleasure to give it at the uh, NTU. So by the end of this talk, I'll do my best to convince you that light matter interaction in 2D materials or flatland, as we call it for brevity, is a very interesting research direction, both from the fundamental um, and applied points of view. So yeah, I wanted to talk you to tell you about the um, uh, Fizodrak experiment, which which was done together with Dmitry Basov's group, uh, which was done in Dmitry Basov's group uh, in, at Columbia. But I decided to focus a bit on 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 um, more uh, high frequencies, uh, yeah, lower frequency side of this of of of, of my research on the terahertz um, domain, and I'll tell you some two stories about terahertz physics in, in in graphene. One one story is a bit old and more applied. Another one is a bit recent. Uh, it's very recent, and I haven't talked to pretty much anyone about this work. So I think you will be the first. So that's why it might be a bit harder to grasp it, but I'll do my best to explain it. Oh, excellent. This is great it's, honor for us. Simple, very, very nice. Thank simple, you very much for yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you, as you know, most of you know that since the discovery of uh, graphene, the family of 2D uh, materials is huge and is not limited to metals and some metals as graphene in the beginning, but also has the representatives from semiconductors, superconductor community, insulators, we have magnets, we have topological insulators, and many different phases of matter can be created and observed in the world of 2D materials. But what is more exciting, in my opinion, for us is that the family of 2D materials offers us this uh, three very unique things. We can uh, place different crystals on top of each other, we can stack them, uh, from, we can, we, and, and, and the second thing, we can align them with respect to each other. And by doing so, we can create different phases and different material, kind of new materials and heterostructures which properties, with properties which could not be found in uh, conventional systems. As probably most of you heard the, uh, the famous example of twisted bilayer graphene, which showed superconducting, uh, insulating, magnetic, and topological behavior just by uh, aligning two graphene layers with respect to each other at 1.1 degrees. This was done in Pablo Herrera's Her 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 group at MIT, and uh, it's a super famous example of what can be done in the world of 2D materials, which cannot be done in other conventional systems. 
Now also, very importantly, we in most of these systems, the density of states is small and the carrier density is not so high. So what we can do, we can gate these materials and change their properties by external um, you know, battery or voltage source. We can go through the whole band structure of this material and explore different uh, and, and explore their properties of, as a function of, of uh, gate voltages. Uh, the next thing which I super like about the materials is that, uh, of course, you know, layered structures could be created before by means of molecular beam epitaxy. However, those uh, machines were rather complicated and complex and bulky, and you need to have special dedicated people to create such heterostructures. Uh, these days, uh, you know, in, uh, in the world of 2D materials, we can uh, create such heterostructures within a day or two. And students can learn how to do it within, uh, I would say, like a month. And then you can create all these fancy devices pretty, pretty much as you could do uh, by the MBE technique, despite the fact it's not uh, scalable as in the case of MBE, but we can still explore very nice physics there and prototype future, future technology. My favorite example is the uh, fractional quantum Hall effect before you get to grow the uh, MBE uh, by, by MB, you have to grow those substrates on the, and then, you know, the quality has to be exceptional. And these days we can make uh, graphite, uh, graphite gated HBN encapsulated devices within a few days and they would show fractional quantum Hall effect and like pretty much every student can do that. So, you know, that being said, 2D materials or the flatland uh, offers us a very convenient playground, a sandbox to explore new physics and prototype uh, future technology. Uh, which is which is relevant for this talk is that the flatland uh, enables light trapping at the nanoscale, um, thereby providing a platform for ex exploring strong uh, light matter interaction. And this happens usually through the excitation of various polaritons, uh, which are hybrid modes consistent of phonons and different quasi-particles in uh, 2D materials. So the low dimensional materials, you know, depending on their type, can support different kinds of those polaritons associated with, you know, different um, uh, quasi-particles hosted by, the, by this or that material. For example, if your system is metallic, you can have uh, self-sustained oscillations of electron density and electromagnetic field, which is called plasma polariton. And, uh, you know, typical metals, uh, graphene or black phosphorus with low density of electrons and even, I guess, tantalum, uh, tantalum disulfide recently have been shown to have also the, the, the plasma polariton modes. And uh, some insulators, some um, polar systems, some polar crystals can support uh, the collective modes between the phonons in such, uh, in such, in such material and electromagnetic field. And those are called phonon polaritons. And importantly, like you can have even combination of three things. Uh, you can have like a system which, uh, we, you can have a hybrid mode between plasmons, phonons, and photons. Those would be called plasma phonon polaritons. And these days, you know, there, are, there is a lot of work being done in terms of like looking at how different quasi-particles can couple to light at the nanoscale given rise to various exotic modes, such as coupler pair polaritons and high TC superconductors. This is a super um, you know, important topic these days. And like people are trying to explore this direction in details. You can have, a, uh, you can have, you can have also like a ferromagnet or antiferromagnet materials where, uh, which, which would happen, which could also hybridize with phonons. So the variety of, of things which can be done is enormous and which is happening is also enormous but you can also not only can you like see those modes but you can use these these modes to look at the new physics and and prototype um you know future technology based on based on this um based, based on this excitation so uh today i'll tell you two stories about um the first type of polaritons which i which i mentioned before about plasmons and graphene I'll tell you, I'll give you an overview of what is happening kind of in graphene plasmonics from the, well, from the hist historical point of view. Then I'll talk uh, about the uh, user using plasmons to resonantly detect terahertz radiation and perhaps amplify the uh, signals. And then I'll tell you like very recent story about the near field magnetic absorption caused by uh, terahertz Bernstein modes in graphene, which is also like a hybrid quasi-particle existing in graphene in the presence of magnetic field. All right, let's get started. So uh, let me start with graphene plasmonic first. Um, 
since the discovery of graphene, a two-dimensional carbon layer of uh, carbon atoms of layer, uh, carbon layer of atoms, it was certainly natural to search and explore its plasmonic response or its collective modes. Uh, and uh, the first, I think the experimental works started in 2011, if I'm not mistaken, maybe a bit earlier. And uh, there, there was like a, the, 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 there was an exploration of far field response by Lon Ju and Feng Wan's group of uh, graphene matter material where graphene was patterned is in short uh, in, in, in relatively narrow ribbons. And these days, most of the work on graphene plasmonics has been done by so-called scanning, uh, uh, scattering types, scanning near field optical microscope, which allows you to visualize and see plasmas by your eyes. And that's why it's kind of, uh, it became super popular technique. And uh, because graphene is flat, it's relative, uh, because graphene is flat and thin, you can approach the tip uh, to the surface of graphene, uh, unlike you, uh, unlike uh, any other two-dimensional electron gases, which are usually buried deep inside their substrate. So, in scanning uh, uh, near type, uh, in scattering type SNOM technique, what is happening is that you have a um, FM uh, tip which is uh, exposed to infrared radiation, and then this radiation launches the uh, those waves propagating, those plasma waves propagating inside a graphene, when they get back scattered from the edge of the device, they come back to the tip and out coupled to the external world. And by using some special smart uh, tricks, um, uh, some heterogeneous detection technique, you can uh, literally map the uh, plasmon fringes, the plasmon modes, which reside in graphene flakes. So as you can see on this slide, I'm showing you one of the first demonstration of graphene plasmons of graphene on silicon oxide. You can see those fringes two or three fringes close to the boundary, those are literally the snapshot of the standing plasma waves in, uh, in graphene measured by this SNOM technique. But as you can see, the, 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 the quality factor of those modes is pretty low. You can see only three oscillations and the, there has been a continuous effort to uh, see whether this uh, the, whether the quality factors of the plasma modes can be increased because like the higher the quality factor, the more the, the deeper you can dig inside the physics and uh, explore a variety of things there and develop practical devices as well. So um, usually the uh, the way these disper the, the the way the usually the way the plasmas are being measured in this technique is by uh, fixing the laser radiation frequency and measuring the uh, plasmon wavelength. So typically the dispersion of two-dimensional plasma has the square root of Q dependence. If you fix the frequency and you measure the plasmon fringes, as I'm showing you here, you can determine the plasmon uh, uh, wave vector. And by damping, you can determine the imaginary part of it. So this was the, the standard technique. Uh, so I'll show you later how we can use it without SNOM uh, measurement technique. And also I'll show you how you can take advantage of this. But so far, uh, the first experiments already revealed that the plasmons propagate with pretty large velocity. Uh, so this was the uh, uh, well, few uh, Fermi velocities in graphene. And uh, graphene plasmons can live in the mid infrared and far infrared, infrared uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And by, again, by applying a gate voltage to a graphene, you can change the chemical potential and you can tune the plasma dispersion uh, in, uh, uh, you, you can tune the plasma dispersion uh, by means of such electrostatic means. But as I said, like there has been a continuous uh, effort to improve the quality factors of such of such modes, and for this reason, uh, you know, uh, research community started encapsulating graphene be between so-called hexagonal boron nitride layers, where uh, similarly to the Kaya toast. Actually, I learned what is Kaya toast pretty much recently, and now I'm in love with that stuff. Before, I was always showing like some sandwich picture, but uh, but now I think Kaya toast is a better example for that. Uh, so if you squeeze the toast, um, you can, you, if, you, if you press the toast hard, you can squeeze the Kaya jam out of the, out of the, uh, out of this, uh, out of the sandwich. So in the same way, if you, if you press two um, hexagonal boron nitride layers to each other, you can, uh, you can, you can squeeze all the residues of, which could have, which could, which could happen to be on top of graphene, and you can create very clean interfaces 
uh, between graphene and hexagonal by boron nitride, improving the improving drastically the environment in which electrons reside in graphene layer. So uh, let me show you what happened after you encapsulated uh, such devices. The work of um, uh, from 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 Frank Coffin's group demonstrated that the uh, that the the quality factor can now be boosted drastically. So you can see many fringes now. Uh, like and you know and super strong light compression, uh, which is the ratio between the free space uh, uh, wavelengths and the plasma wavelengths. You can measure it now accurately, and uh, and this can and 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 so this large quality factors enabled by such encapsulation of of graphene. But you can more you can do even more. You can uh, start looking at the res at the plasmonic response at cryogenic temperatures. And the group of Dmitry Basov developed the first. Uh, cryogenic uh, SNOM uh, technique, and they discovered that, in fact, if you cool down already to 40K, nothing prevents plasmons from scattering. So you can see those fringes everywhere propagating the, uh, in, in, in graphene channel. And those are so-called like quasi-ballistic uh, plasmons. So the quality factor of those were like around 100. And like, uh, you can literally look at very uh, interesting physics by, by measuring uh, plasmonic fringes as a function of different parameters. Like my favorite example is probably the work again from Frank Coppens group when they look at the uh, plasma dispersion as a function of uh, proximity to the to the dielect or to the uh, metallic layer, which was their gate, and they observe in very interesting many body effects by literally like measuring this uh, the, the fringes as a function of different parameters. So uh, you know, again, plasmons. In, in graphene and another system enable us not only to look into the uh, physics of those, but also probably uh, think about how we can take advantage of them to develop practical practical devices. So this is something which we tried together with my colleagues uh, when I was like about to leave uh, MIT. So this was done together at the group of uh, Gregory Goldsman, who is the founder of Scontel uh, company, the single photon detection. He's actually the founder of the single photon detection technique by superconducting nanowires. And he has all the infrastructure to perform terahertz experiments. So like we, we traveled to his lab and explored these devices uh, in his infrastructure with his, with, with, with his colleagues, with, his, um, with the members of his group. And uh, the 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 the, the uh, theoretical part was supported by the Dmitry Svinsov uh, group and devices we done together with Shui Gang Su from 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 Manchester, uh, with whom we worked together in Andrew Gams and Irina Grigorieva's lab at Manchester. So um, the the idea goes pretty much you know well to 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 nineties when well before. Uh, graphene was even discovered. There, there was a work by uh, Michael Diakonov and Michael Schur, who literally said that, uh, you know, you can use field effect transistor uh, to create, uh, and you can use plasmons in the field effect transistor to, uh, to build very sensitive terahertz detector. And the idea was that you couple your field effect transistor to an antenna and you convert high frequency radiation into plasmons, which then reside in the resonant plasmonic cavity formed between the source and drain channel of your field effect transistor. So, and if you have a cavity, they, 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 they predicted that any nonlinearity which existed in your system, for instance, transistor nonlinearity would be enhanced as a result of this plasmon resonance inside the source, inside the field effect transistor channel. Certainly there were a few attempts, quite a few attempts to do this experiment in gallium arsenide, uh, in graphene, this uh, regime was 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 uh, uh, you know also was was explored, but until encaps until graphene was encapsulated, there were no response. So that's and and this is this is where we uh, made our devices. We realized that we can create super high quality graphene devices by encapsulating them again between hexagonal boron nitride, as I showed you, like in, in the context of the Kaya toast, and then uh, what we did, we connected our the, 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 the source of our of our device and the gate of our device to uh, to an antenna, as I'm showing you on this slide, and then we exposed it to terahertz radiation. Like so, this is the typical photo of our device, and then we measured the uh, responsivity, which is the ratio between the photo voltage generated between the source and drain uh, and drain contact uh, divided by the uh, power of incident radiation. 
So uh, in this plot, I'm showing you the uh, result of such measurements, namely the responsivity of uh, such a device as a function of gate voltage. So as you can see, like, um, you know, uh, so, so this data was taken at 100 gigahertz and uh, the response is very boring. So at negative gate voltages, you have some small signal, which is then uh, starts to, which then starts to increase upon approach in the charge neutrality point. And then when you go from holes to electrons, the signal changes its sign, goes to negative, and then it starts to slowly increase. So the lower the temperature, the, res the, the higher was the responsivity. The responsivity was you know, pretty good, it was like uh, comparable to the commercially available detectors. And, but this uh, form factor uh, is, uh, is, you know, it's, it's, this shape was known from the uh, previous experiments on microwave or on um, uh, infrared uh, for the for the of the electronic experiments, and this shape simply is proportional to the derivative of the conductivity to the uh, carrier density, normalized to the conductivity. So we call it the field effect transistor factor. So we can measure it independently by, you know, if you, if you, if you measure the conductivity of your device, you can then differentiate it with respect to the gate voltage. You've got something which looks like that. And this is exactly how our device uh, reacts to 100 gigahertz um, radiation. But then we increase the frequency to two terahertz, increasing the, uh, yeah, we increase the frequency to two terahertz, and we saw that the behavior changed completely. So the black curve here is again the field effect transistors, uh, the field effect uh, transistor factor from the previous slide at 10k, and the red is the measured for the response. As you can see, we saw many resonant fringes, uh, many, many, you know, not fringes, but the uh, kind of dips for uh, the positive gate voltage size and peaks for the negative gate voltage size. And, you know, you could see up to probably seven on each side. And, uh, you know, what are those you, you, you may naturally ask. And then if you literally like uh, model such a system, uh, you will understand immediately that uh, the, this oscillation is nothing but the development of the standing plasma wave uh, uh, standing plasma modes between the source and drain channel in your field effect transistor. So whenever you hit the resonance, the voltage experience uh, an upward trend, it, it experiences an increase of the responsivity. And then if you go further, you, the responsivity drops. So uh, truth being told, we thought the uh, rectification would be much stronger than what we observe. Yet now we understand why is that, like we know like how to tackle it. There are some, you know, plasma damping problems related to the context. So we are working on improving this, but the, uh, the immediate reaction is that, you know, this is like a, uh, a plasmonic interferometer or, you know, which you can potentially use as a spectrometer on chip. So when you shine uh, a terrorist radiation, uh, like of specific frequency, this specific frequency will give you a specific pattern of fringes as a function of gate voltage. So instead of like changing the mirror spacing in your spectrometer, you here you will be changing the gate voltage uh, to tune the plasma uh, velocity and then how you can like uh, sort of simulate this, the, 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 the interferometric, interferometric effect in, in kind of a, on, on chip. Uh, but this was like, uh, certainly like- the, Hi Dennis, you know, I, this is very interesting sure. to me. Um, do, you, do you mind if I just interrupt you and answer your question here? So sure. I, I, I must have kind of, you know, uh, missed this. Um, uh -huh. But what is actual setup? So you have the source drain where, where, you, where, you, where you actually get the current out, but are, are you coming in with normal incidence light? So uh, the setup looks uh, looks is, is 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 as follows. So you have a silicon silicon oxide substrate, mm -hmm. and then you have a small device graphene devices over here, which you then connect one of the contacts to left a lobe of your antenna, and then you connect the gate electrode to another lobe of your antenna. So like on like like I'm showing you on this slide, and then you come from the uh, you use the silicon uh, hemispherical lens to focus your radiation uh, on, on, on your antenna. And uh, is this normal you, incident? It's normal, normal incident, correct. Okay. 
yeah, from 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 the backside. Yeah. So uh, and uh, and then you re you rectified it by transistor nonlinearity or some other nonlinearities which exist in the system. We also explored this in the detail, and then. So, so, maybe, so, 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 so maybe you could explain mm -hmm. that just very quickly. I'm just trying to understand this from a naive uh -huh, point of sure. view. If, if I take, take biolegraphene by itself, it's centrosymmetric. And yeah. so, so second order uh -huh. nonlinearities uh -huh. uh, for, rectif for rectified currents in particular, that's, uh, that's the one that is, uh, mm -hmm. um, that's nonlinearity for, for rectified currents that is important. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 right. Yeah, I, uh, so, so, so the answer to your question would be the following. So you're not measuring like the, the uh, for the current which is generated as a result of some symmetry breaking inside your layer. So like usually you would model it by means of, you know, like you take graphene layer, you put two contacts, you shine normal light and you ask where the current will flow, right? In, yes. In, in, yeah. So uh, we create such an asymmetry by the designing of the coupling geometry. So in the coupling geometry, the asymmetry is uh, in, initiated by means that the, uh, there is a, there is the, the connection is being done between the source and the gate voltage, whereas the drain is uh, is kind of floating in this case. So if you write the boundary conditions for such a coupling scheme, uh, you will see that in this in this geometry, there can be non-zero photovoltage. So you can understand that by means of so-called resistive self-mixing effect. So this effect is based on the transistor non-linearity. So uh, in short mm. words, it works as follows. In the first half of the period of your oscillation, you kind of inject an electrons from the source to your channel, uh, but also you kind of gating your you're also gating your device in the first part of the period so that the conductivity of your system uh, is kind of reduced. So you're injecting more current than you will be depleting in the, in the second half of the period. And this is called resistive self-mixing effect. And uh, that's how you get non-zero photovoltage to compensate for this injection. Maybe we can like sit down later. I, I'll, Thank you I'll very much. In, Thanks. In Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. But Thank the, the, this you. is Thanks. the intuitive picture of this. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, all right, uh, but also you can have many other nonlinearities. You can have photothermoelectric response at the contacts, which also is certainly there. You can also have some uh, quasi hydrodynamic nonlinearities. Non this was actually the reason why we started it, and uh, which actually doesn't require hydrodynamics, but the Euler equation is still there. And if you are com if you uh, if you couple your Euler equation to the this type of boundary conditions, you immediately get the non-zero photocard. All right, uh, yeah, so, uh, but as I said, you can, you can also use this as a tool to probe collective modes uh, in, various, uh, in various devices in the conditions where snow may be hard, for instance, in the presence of magnetic field or at super low temperatures. So that's, this is something which we're developing now. As you can see, I measured the, you know, just, just characterized the device from the point of view of measuring its plasmon wavelengths as a function of carrier density. And by, by doing some approximation of the experiment, you can extract the, uh, the tau p, the plasmon lifetime or the quality factor, which was pretty low here, but you know, we kind of understand now uh, why is that despite the fact that the devices are much more, much more high, of higher quality. But what is more important, you can use this to probe collective modes in um, you know, weird objects such as like graphene HBM super lattices. And we went to like, if you, you, you some of you may know that, that uh, graphene and hexagonal boron nitride have very much similar um, crystal lattice, but but the crystal constant, uh, but the the, the 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 lattice constant is a bit different uh, between the two, and therefore not only do you have the main neutrality point or like the simple dispersion, but you also have in the dispersion the appearance of the mini band as a result of the super lattice formation, and those mini bands. Uh, you can also we we also we managed to observe those resonances in the mini bands uh, where those kind of mini bands plasmons. Uh, leave and exist. They, they the resonance the resonances uh, you know appeared in the negative side of our photoresponse, which means we passed the Van Hoff singularity and indeed entered the uh, mini band regime and uh, detected the plasmons there. So uh, this is kind of you know uh, this can go well towards uh, your works, Justin, on on the uh, chiral plasmons and uh, and this baryogenesis phenomena. Uh, which you, which you explored with, with Mark Rudner. And I think by using this technique, you can kind of uh, probe this phenomena 
at super low temperatures uh, where the, the quality factors of all those modes should be should be high so uh with that i would like to wrap up with this part and let you uh, and, and uh, leave you with two messages that uh, graphene plasmons can be used for uh, sensitive turns detection and uh, it can be used i mean this setting which i showed you can be used to probe collective modes in the presence of low temperatures and um and like now we are thinking about doing this in the presence of magnetic fields uh yeah if there are any questions here we can probably uh, talk about that if not i'll move further any questions from students maybe maybe right. let me just ask a very very simple yeah, question sure. um are you able to um to bring in circularly polarized light into your um, into your setup. Uh, yeah, so uh, we yeah, I'll show you some data like in the in the next slides when we uh, when we uh, did these experiments in the presence of circularly polarized light, but without having antennas, we just had contacts, mm. and we saw effects which are related to the helicity. Which means that even like even even though your device is much much smaller than the uh, wavelengths of incident terrorist radiation, you still can have if you can still reveal the effects of chirality of incident light. And I think now we kind of understand like what is the next step. I'll, we can discuss later with you. Sure. Uh, to to so because usually the problem here is always like context because they act as antennas, and if you have those antennas, you kind of um, screw up your um you know distribution of electromagnetic field around your channel and uh, it's not that you are absorbing light by uh, free space light but you start absorbing them by near field effects but like it seems there are ways to circumvent that and even though the device is small you can play around this to get circularly polarized light yeah okay. yeah all right so yeah let's move on to the second to the last part uh of, of my presentation so I'll, this time I'm going to start with kind of theoretical consideration, although the experiment was done first, but I think it's going to be easier to grasp uh, if we start from the simple uh, theoretical description uh, of the, not, the like not, not, not theoretical, probably intuitive description of the phenomena I'm going to be talking uh, later. So again, let me introduce the team with whom this experiment was done. So the experiments uh, we did in the group of Sergei Ganichev and Regensburg together with uh, Erwin and Ivan, and uh, the, the, we, we, we made the devices with Isabel at Pablo's lab at MIT. And again, uh, theory support was provided by uh, Dmitry Svinsov. And like this time we used amazing uh, HBN crystals from Son Leo and James Edgar. Uh, and you know, this happened to be probably crucial because the quality of the devices which we, which we made was like pretty enormous. So uh, let me start with the following thing. So, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know the uh, plasmons in two dimensions, and in particular in graphene. If you if you are if you if you don't account for some you know proximitized screening, is uh, simply a square root of q has a simple square root of q dispersion at zero magnetic field, and like for illustrating for for false like some you know. Uh, illustrative purposes i'm plotting you the photon dispersion which goes much steeper here as compared to to plasmons. And this is the simple picture which happens in the presence of uh, which have which exists in, uh, without magnetic field uh, when you include uh when you when you switch on external magnetic field you uh start having you you modify this dispersion in such a way that your plasma dispersion gaps out at the uh cyclotron frequency at the omega c and below omega c you don't have any bulk plasma modes you may only have edge plasma modes and the but at high q you know usually the the dispersion pretty much resembles your uh zero zero magnetic field dispersion uh this is the case un, until you go to the uh very large q and until and 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 uh, and there at very large q and in uh larger than one of uh, one divided by rc where rc is the cyclotron radius and in and uh until unless you uh, until you use this the, the very uh clean devices so like in those clean devices and at large q you may see uh the emergence of so-called bernstein modes which is uh which is a hybrid mode uh, uh which appears when 
uh, electrons experience both the uh, plasmonic resonance with external radiation and the cyclotron resonance uh, harmonics with the system, or, or like yeah, cyclotron resonance uh, in, in the system. In a sense, it's a hybridization kind of between the cyclotron electron motion and the plasmonic electron motion, if you want some kind of intuitive picture, but like the, the physics is much deeper there. So those modes were predicted uh, back in the 50s by Ira Bernstein in the context of plasma physics. And later they were explored experimentally in the two dimensional electron gases. And uh, there were theory, theoretical works on graphene that those modes should exist there. But we looked at these modes from the different perspective. If you, uh, if you look at the dispersion, you will realize that the, uh, the dispersion at large Q is very flat. And uh, there is a gap separating it from the next, uh, from the next branch. And here the dispersion is, you know, uh, so flat that you should, that, that you know, nat it's natural to us, well, to, to it, 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 by, this, by this way, it's very natural to get a uh, large plasmonic density of states. So it's a kind of, you know, the, uh, plasmonic one hop singularity in a sense. And if you have large plasmonic density of states, you should immediately you know, uh, expect that you will have strong enhancement of uh, light matter interaction if you manage to absorb them, if you manage to absorb the radiation at uh, those various Q numbers. So all the previous, most of the previous experiments were done with the means of special grating, which would give you a specific uh, Q, uh, uh, which would cut a specific cue out of dispersion, and the, by this way you could, uh, you know, explore and 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 catch the presence of those Bernstein modes in two-dimensional electron systems such as gallium arsenide-based heterostructures. But uh, you know, we thought like, can we take advantage of this kind of double resonance, like between the cyclotron resonance and plasmon resonance, metaplasmon resonance, to facilitate absorption if we manage to absorb at all those cues? And you know, we realized that our typical devices, well, that was a kind of accidental device, truth be told, but but we realized that like we can use this configuration to uh, absorb to absorb electromagnetic radiation at, at many Q. So the way we did it, we kind of uh, we introduced our contacts deep inside a graphene channel. And we made them super narrow and super sharp so that like the scattered electromagnetic uh, light would have many compon components of the uh, Fourier components. And that's, that's how we would, you know, uh, we would try to absorb electromagnetic uh, radiation and all those Q. So let me show the experimental data. Uh, so th this was kind of the hypothesis which we, which, which we uh, rever you know, reversely thought is, is, is the purpose of our experiment. So, um, so this is the typical device which, uh, which, which we created, uh, we, which we created at MIT. So it's a pretty wide uh, graphene channel with natural edge. And as you can see, the context is not like in conventional hole bars sticking out outside from the channel. But in this case, they were like kind of buried inside graphene channel, uh, like as I'm showing you on this schematic. And, and here, uh, as Justin was asking previously, is indeed the incident uh, beam coming to graphene either circularly polarized or linearly polarized. I'll show you the data for that later. And what we're doing, we're measuring the either resistivity as a function of instant rad radiation or so-called like kind of polymetric response or the photovoltage, uh, which is generated um, uh, in response to terahertz radiation. And so uh, this is the result of such measurements. So uh, here I'm showing you the resistivity as a function of magnetic field measured in the dark. Already like at, you know, uh, already at 0.3 uh, Tesla, the resistivity is less than one ohm, which is absolutely remarkable for this type of devices. So this is the, the kind of the, this is the, uh, when, when you apply a magnetic field, you start guiding your electrons by magnetic field inside the uh, channel. And uh, usually people think of the resistivity in the presence of magnetic field as the pure at small magnetic field as the pure resistivity of the bulk from which you can infer the mobility and the scattering time which were enormous of course at zero magnetic field everything is limited by the device uh, edges and uh, 
of, because there is a, like a, at zero magnetic field, there is a strong ballistic transport and strong ballistic response there. But like you see, you start, so this is the, you know, pretty large carrier density, I guess it's like three times 10 to the 12. And you have Shubnik of the gas oscillations appear and it's also pretty small magnetic fields, not the, not, not the smallest possible, but you know, it's a typical picture uh, for graphene devices. Uh, on, uh, well, modulo the super small resistivity, which, which happened to be the case for this device. But when you turn on like a 0.69 terahertz radiation, you start having this, um, Increase of the like increase of the resistivity uh, uh, close to the uh, uh, position of the half of the magnetic field where you would expect your cycloton resonance. So, in other words, your cycloton resonance should happen somewhere here. So, cycloton resonance is a phenomenon when your incident radiation frequency matches the cycloton motion of your of your uh, electrons, and uh, at at the position of the cycloton resonances, a cycloton resonance we saw pretty much nothing at such a high carrier density. But at half of the magnetic field, you see this uh, enhancement of the resistivity for the, for the given power. And it was like scaling, it was scaling linear with power. So the higher the power you put on the system, the stronger was this signal at the half BCR, whereas the BCR was almost nothing. Like uh, if you convert it to the kind of photo uh, response, you will not for the response, but for like the, the, the like the, um, uh, for the resistance, you get that the resistivity enhances for this particular power up to 25%. And as I said, the higher the power, the higher is the, the uh, photo resistance in this case. But like, so, like as you can see, there is no features whatsoever at uh, other magnetic fields. And there is some like um, decay, the decrease of the Shubnik of the gas oscillation amplitude uh, at, at high magnetic fields, just probably because of the electron heating, you, you increase the, temp the electron temperature and Shumnik of the gas oscillations uh, amplitude drop because of, you know, of, 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 enhanced, of enhanced heating. But this uh, strong effect is here. But, the, but the, uh, if, you, if you think next about this PCR over two process is the process which, which appears at the uh, close to the uh, cycloton resonance harmonics. It's like as if you are exciting electrons between the two Landau levels in the uh, you know in the quantum limit, uh, which is a kind of impossible process because like uh, or if 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 possible then it's extremely weak process because of the selection rules and even in the classical picture this is uh, this cannot be this this can't happen at all unless you have super strong and homogeneous electric fields but usually second order cycloton resonance is always much weaker effect than the first order cycloton resonance. And this is not the case in this in, in, in this measurement. So this is not the cycloton resonance physics here. Uh, we saw this effect in the photovoltage as well. So you see there is this, the, 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 the spike in the photovoltage uh, was pretty strong for all carrier densities. And uh, you know we saw it for different frequencies of incident radiation at 0.69 to 2.54. Uh, terahertz and in, and this feature always happens and the and the sec, and the at the overtone of the cycloton resonance and we even saw the, the second overtone here marked by the marked marked by, by those arrows. Importantly, the polarization dependence of this uh, of this feature of this so, so, so of this feature is uh, is the following that so let's look at this plot on the on the right hand side where i'm showing you the photovoltage versus magnetic field measured at small carrier density where the cycloton resonance indeed can be observed and at super high frequency so this is the only condition where we saw the cycloton resonance this is the in this case it was a strong effect and it was uh, not only the strong effect but it was also sensitive to the to the, to the helicity of the incident radiation as you expect for positive magnetic field, you have a you have a stronger feature for the right circular polarized light, and for the negative magnetic field, the situation is the opposite. But those uh, overtones they are not sensitive to the polarization dependence. So those uh, those observation kind of let us thought that we are dealing with some near field effect of magnetic absorption, and uh, our colleagues uh, from Dmitry Svensson's group calculated the magnetic absorption. And uh, of the, uh, uh, in the presence of uh, magnetic field and in the presence of different frequency, uh, if you assume the emergence of those flat, uh, quasi flat uh, Bernstein modes in your magnetic absorption spectrum. So, this is the loss function 
uh, as a function of you know low loss function plotted on the three on the on the color map where on the y-axis you have a frequency on the x-axis you have a wave number and uh, so this plot is just the zoomed in version close to the second uh, to, to, to the two omega c uh, this, this is the zoomed two omega c region and let's look at the real distribution of the uh, electromagnetic field so at, at zero magnetic field close to the sharp contact you just have a regular plasmonic fringes uh, propagating inside your graphene channel. But then when you increase the uh, frequency and you stay above the uh, cyclotron resonance gap, so there's the top dashed line, you just have, you know, simply a similar picture, but with a slightly different period, as you would expect for modified magnetoplasma dispersion as compared to conventional plasma dispersion. But now you see what happens if I go just below the cyclo the, 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 the two omega C region, you see like a coexistence of two modes, a fast mode and a slow mode. And indeed, as you can you know, think of, you kind of intersect this dispersion by two points, one over here and one over here. And there should be like a coexistence of two uh, wave numbers in a sense. And then uh, you can calculate the absorbed power. So I don't have much time to describe uh, these calculations, you can just, uh, when you cal calculate this, you can compare the absorption with the experiment and you see pretty much very nice agreement that the uh, absorption is kind of uh, highly asymmetric with respect to the position of the BCR over two point. It has a long tail and this long tail exists because you approach it from the one particular side of the, uh, of the magnetoplasma dispersion. And then you have a sharp peak where you have a coalescence kind of of those uh, two modes. Let me show you a, a movie how this works. So you start with small, you start with small uh, cyclotron frequency, uh, once again, where you have just a plasmonic mode, and then you get to this coalescence point where you have like now, uh, you know, you, when you intersect the dispersion at two positions, and then where there is the, the absorption is uh, drastically in enhanced. So you kind of have a plasmon and the cycloton motion quasi particle, and you can call it like a cyclotron or something like that, a bench time mode. But uh, this is the actually the snapshot of how it should look if you were to measure this phenomena in the uh, near field technique. All right, so I think with that, I would like to wrap up. I'm, I'm running out of time. So I told you that uh, unlike naive expectations, you can have cyclotron resonance, resonance overtones in uh, high quality graphene devices, which are not related to the uh, conventional, you know, cyclotron resonance physics. Those are very weak effects and usually forbidden. Uh, so those effects exist because you have near field absorption of light scattered by sharp teeth, giving you all Q components and initiating those Bernstein modes, which I showed you how they exist, uh, like uh, in, 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 in the uh, XY graphene plane. Uh, with that, I'd like you to thank you for your attention. I'm ready to take questions and discuss. This the last part is a, a bit complicated, but we can talk about that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. It's very nice. Um, questions, especially from students. So let me just start a little bit off. Um, sure. So 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 it's very interesting these um these burst time modes or you what even now you can see um um cyclorons. Um. So if you go back one or two slides, you basically showed like a, uh yeah that that one yeah it's very nice. So so in the theory plot, it seemed like there were actually a succession of uh of possible other overtones as 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 you would have it. Mm -hmm. um, did you observe any, uh, uh, um, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, the next order which we saw was the, uh, why it's not, it's the third order. So, so this is the uh, BCR over two and those arrows are BCR over three. So we have those kind of weak feature here and then they decay. And the reason why we decay, we also understand quite uh, well now is that like if you, um, a look at the amplitude of uh, uh, Fourier components as a function of Q. Uh, for this particular case, you will see that you know the, the 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 further you go in Q, the amplitudes decrease. So, like we happen to 
catch the right size of the context, to be honest, to absorb at two omega C. So mm -hmm. uh, at three omega C, we see effect, but it's weaker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, you know, it, actually, we stop there. Yeah, uh, just one one more slide back again. Sorry, mm -hmm. just one more slide. With yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So um, it seemed like it was a very large, actually yeah. very large uh, circular polarization sensitivity, particularly at you know your one your one omega C, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and um, so I, the the uh, the question I have is is the following. Um, so. At the start, you were saying that because of these Bernstein modes, you have very flat density states. It's like a double resonance feature or something, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you might have a Van Hoek singularity for the plasmons, but mm -hmm. the eventual um, response is not super large. And in fact, actually is dwarfed by mm -hmm. the, uh, the one omega C response. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any more uh, kind of... Um, can, can you comment or, or yeah. in, in particular, yeah. I, I'm also interested in understanding how do you know it's a super flat dispersion as well experimentally? Is there any, any empirical evidence for that super flat? Mm -hmm. So answering to your first question about the relative magnitude of the cyclotron resonance and the second order, like, or, or let's call it like, or let's call it overtone. So, um, I mean, this whole story initially, which we uh, started, was to explore this effect of microwave-induced resistance oscillations and the cyclotron resonance physics and graphene. We actually didn't even like look for this and didn't know that those exist. And the first observation we ever saw was that the cyclotron resonance appears only at small uh, carrier density is close to the neutrality point below 10 to the 12th per centimeter square. Mm -hmm. So if you dope your graphene, your cyclotron resonance disappears. And you should, you should always remember that we are talking here about not interband transitions, right? We, uh, from the conduction band to the valence band or from the valence band to conduction band. But we are talking about very small uh, frequency uh, and we are looking at the uh, kind of quasi-classical phenomena close to this close to the close to the Fermi lab, Fermi energy right so the uh, cyclotron resonance physics exists only at small carrier densities close to the neutrality point and only at very high frequencies at the moment we dope uh, the device to the point where I showed you on the first slide cyclotron resonance is gone and we kind of understand it because like in this case we think is the you know the more you dope graphene uh, to uh, away from the neutrality point, uh, the more metallic it becomes. And if you have a kind of metallic system, it starts acting as a mirror for the incident um, terahertz radiation. And because uh, cyclotron resonance phenomena is not a mere field effect, it's just the absorption of, uh, you know, of, of a bulk in a sense, then like the further you go in the carrier density, the more reflection or yeah, the more reflection of there's radiation from graphene you will have. And uh, therefore uh, you, would, you, should, you should not uh, see cyclotron resonance features at high um, uh, carrier densities. But the cyclotron resonance overtone, which is like not related to the cyclotron resonance is a near field effect. And it happens when light gets scattered from the contact into your uh, graphene channel and excites those modes there and therefore like it, it's actually not sensitive to the carrier density at all so that's our explanation so in order to compare these uh, effects we really needed to go to super small uh, carrier density like below uh, 10 to the 12 much below 10 to the 12 and there we saw indeed a very strong first order cyclotron resonance yeah i see, I see. Yeah. more questions Students, faculty, see one one uh, one professor here. Young Po is here. Um, anyone? I, I have a whole list of questions, but you know, I, I need to yeah, we should give other people yeah. chance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, 
if, if there are no questions uh, specifically for um, Dennis, um, I think let's let, let, let's uh, thank him uh, for this very excellent, very exciting talk about very new things in plasmonics and in, in, in graphene-like structures. Um, and and we can we can end here, and then you know we can talk a little bit after a little bit. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, many thanks for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chong, you can stop the recording if you want.